We know that drugs like Ozempic, also called the GLP-1 receptor agonists, are remarkably effective for weight loss. We also know that these drugs have been shown to have other possible benefits like improving cardiovascular and metabolic health. But do these benefits come with a cost? In this episode, we'll talk specifically about whether those benefits come at the expense of losing one of our most valuable tissues in what we know about protecting it, and that is muscle mass. When we're talking about programs or medications that induce weight loss, we have to consider what will happen to muscle tissue. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one, muscle mass helps us to be resilient. It's a lot harder to gain than it is to lose. Number two, having low muscle mass, called sarcopenia, puts us at risk for metabolic diseases like insulin resistance and diabetes, as well as decreased survival when we get sick, falls, frailty, and overall bad health outcomes. Number three, if a person loses muscle mass during a weight loss program, but then regains that weight, that person could have even less muscle mass compared to where they started. So this question is really important, but there's a problem because although it would be ideal to lose fat and gain muscle, that's not what usually happens in a weight loss program. When most people lose weight, they generally don't just lose fat mass. They tend to lose muscle mass as well. And this can occur even when the weight loss is gradual. So the question we really need to start with is, when people lose weight on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, is the risk of muscle wasting higher than that of a typical weight loss program? And we also need to keep in mind that it's not just muscle mass, but muscle strength and quality that keeps us resilient as we age. So how much loss from muscle is typical during a weight loss program? The old rule used to be about 20 to 25% of every pound loss would come from lean mass. Lean mass includes muscle mass, but also includes the weight of other non-fat tissues like organs and connective tissues. We now know that the actual percent loss of lean mass depends on a lot of things like protein intake, resistance training, age, starting body weight, starting body composition, and the amount of weight lost. The first place we should be able to go to answer our question is straight to the large randomized controlled clinical trials. But unfortunately, those studies typically only report changes in body weight and not changes in body composition or strength. There are fortunately some exceptions that we can look at. For example, in the step one trial, which looked at semaglutide for weight loss, there were 140 patients whose body compositions were measured via DEXA scan. And in those patients who were taking semaglutide, lean mass did in fact contribute to a substantial amount of the total weight loss, about 38% at 68 weeks. Fortunately, in those patients, there was proportionally more fat lost, causing overall body fat percent to decrease. And this came from both total fat and visceral fat. But this study had a major design limitation, and that is that the participants didn't engage in a robust resistance or strength training program. Instead, they received encouragement to increase their physical activity to 150 minutes per week. And the activity specifically cited was walking. So this study wasn't designed with a strength training program or resistance training program built in. But what about other studies? In a similar outcome from the SUSTAIN-8 trial where semaglutide was used for glucose control in diabetes, lean mass measured in 178 patients accounted for about 40% of the total weight lost at 52 weeks. and like the step one trial, this study wasn't designed with a resistance training program built in. Another much smaller randomized crossover trial with 30 participants with obesity over 12 weeks reported a similar effect at a lower dose of semaglutide, where about 24% of the weight loss was from lean mass. But what about newer drugs like the combined GLP-1 GIP receptor agonists? Well, it turns out that even those drugs have been associated with substantial losses in lean mass despite improving the ratio of fat mass to lean mass. Now, there are some studies of GLP-1 receptor agonists that reported preserved muscle mass or preserved strength, but a lot of those studies used less reliable methods to measure body composition, so I don't find them particularly reassuring. So taken overall, there's certainly enough evidence out there to make us concerned that muscle wasting could occur on these drugs, particularly if drug therapy is the only intervention. Importantly, that doesn't mean that these risks outweigh the benefits because that's an individual consideration. And that's because from what we're seeing so far, these drugs could have really important impacts on some of the disease processes that underpin the most common causes of death in modern economies. So if we don't wanna lose muscle, 
What are some general principles for preserving muscle mass and strength on a typical weight loss program? Before we go into these, it's important to know that we don't have studies specifically about how to avoid muscle loss on GLP-1 receptor agonists. So these are general principles that are based in the science literature for weight loss. I also want to emphasize that none of this is medical advice or nutritional advice. And you should always ask for your doctor's recommendation before making any health decisions. And that brings us to principle number one, which is protein intake. Looking across the science literature, there is good evidence to suggest that maintaining adequate protein intake and perhaps even increasing protein intake in some cases can preserve muscle mass during a weight loss program. And that evidence from my standpoint is quite compelling. So what does adequate protein intake mean? The RDA or recommended dietary allowance of protein for adults is 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, about 0.36 grams per pound per day. That means for an adult who weighs 160 pounds, that would be about 58 grams per day. Some scientists point out that the RDAs were established using techniques that could underestimate protein requirements for healthy individuals. For example, there are times when protein requirements can be higher, like certain athletic training programs or wound healing or pregnancy. And figuring out the exact amount of protein that someone should have can get complex. So please do consult with your doctor and a dietitian. And that brings us to number two, which is strength training. This has been studied extensively across the science literature in terms of its ability to prevent muscle wasting during a weight loss program. The evidence suggests that there is a robust beneficial effect on muscle mass and strength compared to when a resistance training program is not included. In addition to improving muscle health, strength training has also been shown to help preserve bone density during a weight loss program, and that can be a particular concern as we age. And that brings us to number three, which is monitoring. It's hard to control what we can't measure. There are a variety of techniques to measure body composition, and some of them are more accurate than others. But regardless of which technique is being used, whether it's a DEXA scan, or other techniques like volumetrics or bioimpedance, sticking with the same technique across multiple time points can allow someone to get a sense of how body composition is changing over time. So let's recap. Number one, there's enough data out there to tell us that we should be thinking about what's happening to muscle tissue and strength on these next generation weight loss drugs. We have some preliminary evidence that muscle losses could be substantial on GLP-1 receptor agonists but we need more data to know for sure. It will be important for doctors to think about this risk as well as the other risks like GI side effects in light of the potential benefits of these drugs. Number two, there are general principles for preventing muscle loss during weight loss, but we do need more definitive evidence to see how well, if at all, those techniques work on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Thank you so much for listening. If you wanna support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the like and subscribe button. We share these videos with your friends. You can also head over to mixdrilling.com where you can find the sign up for the newsletter. Please also consider finding us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify where you can leave up to a five-star review. That helps us to grow and reach more people. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you next time. The content of this podcast is not medical advice and should not be interpreted as medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. You should not attempt to implement any of the topics or concepts discussed on this podcast without the direct approval and supervision of your own physician. This podcast should not take precedence over the information provided to you by your healthcare provider or official public health sources. Please visit nickstrolling.com for relevant disclosures and full terms of use.